Geographic on assignment. North of the Arctic Circle lies a harsh and forbidding world, populated by elusive animals and filled with breathtaking scenery. Now, experience a raw, behind-the-scenes look at how this perilous land is captured on film. Live with our National Geographic crew, facing frigid temperatures and risky travel over rough ice. We'll go right to the edge to bring back the brutal power and majestic wonder of life in the frozen Arctic when National Geographic takes you on assignment. Working in the Arctic is as close to working on another planet as I could imagine. It was a psychological hardship at times because of the isolation, because of uh, the fact that there was nowhere else to go. Five, eight, two. The thing that the Arctic teaches you instantly is that you have no control. Everything is different up there, and you're really a babe in the woods when you first get there. Except that there are no woods. This is Canada's Lancaster Sound, 500 miles north of the Arctic Circle. It's one of the harshest places on Earth. But as the summer sun moves north and touches the frozen sea, this perilous world plays host to some of Earth's most elusive animals. And to capture them on film means going right to the edge. Into this daunting wilderness came National Geographic's Lisa Truitt to film one of nature's most dramatic stories. Everywhere I work is is risky, but the Arctic is more risky than most. It's a more powerful place than most. It's more unpredictable. So I knew there was always a chance that the best laid plans could go completely awry and we could come back sort of empty-handed. So for this film, I needed the best crew in the business. People you could count on when you couldn't count on the Arctic. Renowned wildlife cameraman Neil Redding couldn't wait to get there. But for someone whose reputation was made in tropical rainforests, the frozen north was a new form of torture. The weather conditions were the, the thing that made it difficult, the cold, the blowing snow, and the danger at times, uh, mainly the breakup of the ice. As for Chris West, despite a career of recording sound in unlikely places, he soon found he'd been no place quite like the Arctic. But the more I was on the ice, the more I saw, I learned that uh, this is not all fun. This is a very dangerous environment to be in. Yet for underwater specialist Doug Allen, going to the Arctic was almost like coming home. Maybe it's having done a lot of diving in the cold over the years. I kind of get to thinking that, that cold is mostly psychological. In polar expeditions, cutting corners can cost lives. And so on top of the film gear, you have to bring everything else you need to survive. Food, shelter, fuel, and transportation. I never even seen a skidoo before. I arrived there and they say, oh, there's your skidoo. And I say, oh yeah? Well, how do you start the thing? The animals are at the edge, far out across the ice. To get there, the crew will have to traverse the only surface that shields them from the frigid sea. Miles of ridges, cracks, and frozen plains. Cameras, the sound recording equipment, was put through an unbelievable amount of punishment. You rattle your bones, you know, we're flying along at a fairly high speed over rough ice, and you can look back and see all your gear, it's just pounding, bam, 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 bam. bam. 
it never gets dark during the seasons that we were there. And there's no ground beneath your feet, it's ice, it's frozen ocean. Which, which is moving and breaking while you're living on it. For the crew, no day is ever without its struggles and strains. Camping in the Arctic is, is very rustic. You have to have as little with you as you possibly need to survive because you are constantly having to move camp at a moment's notice. So we had no luxuries like bathrooms. You might want to go to the toilet and it's an effort. You don't want to go because you know you get out there and it's playing a gale and it's snow and you've got to take your clothes off. You know, and you, know, you really hate. I check stuff here. Ice, ice coffee. One day blends into the night, which blends into the next day, and you really lose all sense of time. You eat when you're hungry and when you're not filming. You sleep when there's nothing to film. You, you really, everything you do is dictated by the Arctic. But for a film crew, staying at ground level often limits the view. So they decided to go up in an ultralight aircraft. Even on bright summer days, one gust of wind could blow it out of the sky. I think some of the most exciting times, even though I gotta admit I wasn't always comfortable, were the times I was up in the ultralight. I mean, it was a it was a real kind of a rush. I mean, this Glenn was quite a good pilot. We were usually going up with the plane loaded to the max if we were filming. And I can just remember the kind of anxious times when the plane is careening down the ice, and he would sort of tweak it just at the right moment when the when the skis hit a bump and it would kind of vault us into the air. There's no one else around for hundreds and hundreds of miles. You know, it's just absolutely strange feeling and almost primeval. You're, you're experiencing something that hasn't changed by the hand of man at all. Arctic life is in delicate balance, all time for a springtime bloom. As the sun warms the air, the frozen seas begin to break up, and that starts a rush to polar feeding grounds. For a few weeks each year, these waters are food-rich lanes on a migratory highway. Moving steadily northward until halted by unbroken ice, even the massive bowhead whale comes in search of food. Beneath the ice cover lies a seasonal bounty. Chilling depths was Doug Allen's job. And suddenly, from all this sort of crazy maelstrom of sound and snow up above, you suddenly go into this completely peaceful, weightless world. So it's like kind of slipping into a, a darkened room, if you will. Tropical colors and remarkable life forms thrive in the cold Arctic waters. So you have this feeling of immense distance and space underneath the ice. And everything is just different shades of blue. Where ice meets open sea is the best place to find marine mammals. And Doug hit the jackpot when the belugas arrived. Long before you, you see a beluga, you hear groups of them chirping away in the distance and, and screeching to each other. They 
they were like, you know, like these bodybuilder guys, they get themselves all puffed up and ripped up just to do their display. They looked absolutely stunning. They were, they were just pure muscle. was a productive dive, but topside conditions had changed. The ice was starting to move. Tremendous forces were at work on the ice edge, cracking and splitting it apart. The Inuit guides, drawing on generations of know-how, watched closely for signs of impending trouble. Caught on the wrong side of a growing fracture, the camp was in danger of drifting off to sea. And when it started to happen, Neil, Chris, and Lisa were out filming several miles away. It was a really good day because we'd done a nice sequence before that. And, uh, and this was a, getting a real bonus day. And uh, all of a sudden, there's all the Inuits going that way, very fast, on their, on their skis. And, uh, and we thought, well, why were they going in a hurry, you know? heading back to camp and realize that the, a gigantic piece of ice that our camp is on is on its way out to sea and we're a long way from it. I reckon another five minutes and we would have been stranded. In danger of being set adrift, they had minutes to break camp and make a run for safer ice. <laughs> The danger is that when a slab of ice the size of Cleveland starts floating away, you can't feel it. And if the Inuit hadn't told us what was happening, we wouldn't have known until it was too late. Facing an ever-widening crack with only minutes to spare, the Inuit towed crew and gear across to safety on makeshift rafts of ice. Sure, we could have probably been airlifted off, but we, they have a policy that you leave your gear and your snowmobiles, and they just take the humans. <laughs> so, well, we, we made it, all right. For the crew, it had been a sort of initiation, the fuller version of trial by fire. Now, there was little to do but sit out the bad weather. Not much filming going to be done today, old chap. There's absolutely nowhere to go. It's just white. You know, you're in your tent or you're out of your tent. And if you're out of your tent, you're not comfortable. The thing that really was the most difficult for me, I think, was not being able to really uh, take a decent shower, you know, and kind of living with yourself, uh, being dirty all the time. Uncleanliness because of the lack of showers. That's, uh, you tend to start getting a little bit sick of being dirty. We have a little setback. It started raining in the middle of the night. And the snow is better than rain, but even though we've got everything packed in watertight things, still everything's getting wet, and it's going to take a long time to sort our gear out after this. I could feel the crew getting frustrated because they were up there to work, and we weren't able to work. It was almost like the, the, the stretch of bad weather would just go almost to set you over the edge, but, you know, 
and spirit wise and all of a sudden you get a nice day and it recharges your batteries and you'd be raring to go again you know and that's what kept us going that one once in a while good day in the run of bad weather With the Arctic again at its pristine best, the legendary narwhals appeared. Despite their sword-like tusks, these swift, deep-diving whales are among the shyest creatures in polar seas. I think West wore one beer underwear for four weeks. <laughs> Three. Three. Great. We're running out of water. Sorry, guys. <laughs> How I look. <laughs> After the first cleanup in weeks, they could finally get back to work. An Arctic summer is fleeting, and they'd only filmed a small part of what they'd come here to get. these waters in great numbers. And when thick-billed murres arrived, Doug rigged a remote underwater camera to capture their dives on tape. The murres take these incredible dives up to three minutes and 300 feet deep to catch fish. They're like the penguins of the Arctic. So we just positioned the camera where they were diving, and then we could sit back and watch the action on a monitor nearby. are here for more than food. They head to a lonely island in the middle of Lancaster Sound, where they nest and breed by the hundreds of thousands. With only weeks to go before a short summer's end, Neil and Chris followed them to Prince Leopold Island. A bleak, desolate place of steep cliffs and ledges where Arctic weather is often at its worst. Famous for its piercing winds and brutal storms, landing on Prince Leopold is treacherous. And though the surface looks smooth, it's all sharp stone and flaking rock. And a tough place to camp. In hindsight, I think we could have picked a better or shorter spot. But when they just drop you with two ton in gear, yeah, I mean, it's very hard to move that anywhere else. So you tend to say, oh, this is a good spot for a yeah. kids. It was incredibly bleak. I mean, the cliff just falls away, a thousand feet straight down. Each time we get out a thousand foot straight out of the water. So we're very careful to come down. We had a couple of days of good weather yeah. when we first arrived. The first two days were really pleasant to the point where we thought, wow, this is going to be really a piece of cake. You know, it's going to be ideal for filming and everything. And then it just went downhill after that. Held captive in their tents by high winds, freezing rain and snow, it was a psychological test as tough as any they'd known. 
Well, I had the wind slide down a bit today. It's only blowing 50 knots at the moment. At least it's not raining. Could be worse. Right, who says it doesn't rain in the Arctic? Who says it doesn't rain in the Arctic? You have to have uh, some sort of uh, reading material uh, or something. Uh, otherwise, you just sit there and dwell and, and dwell and dwell and dwell, you know. <laughs> yeah, I'll add day off today because I'm not feeling very well. I'm cold. So I've been very useful to tidy up the tent here. It's very nice and pretty. And I've made this little thing here to see days to release. Working on this, we're going on the 23rd, you see, for August. That's the second one. So there's two days gone already. So we've got two days for 21 days. Later. And we, we had a little calendar that we were crossing off. To the point where you're actually crossing half days off by putting the line halfway through the number. And I got annoyed with you one day because any time I got annoyed with you because you jumped ahead one day. That's and right. That was my job to cross off the number, not yours. That's not right. You sure you didn't cross that off today? I don't trust you. Beleaguered by the worst summer storms in years, Chris and Neil were going stir-crazy, Arctic style. All the eggs have fallen off the cliff. All the eggs have fallen off the cliff. All of them. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, that's about all we're done on the weather at the moment. The apartment's about uh, five degrees over. No traffic, but I think Lisa's going to contact us at eight o'clock or twenty hundred hours. Over. Miles to the south, Lisa and Doug set up shop on Somerset Island. With luck, belugas were on the way. We built a tower in an inlet where the belugas come every summer. They're there to molt and they literally swim right into the shallows to rub their old skin off on the rocks. To catch them molting, Doug had to sit in the tower stranded by high tide for six or seven hours at a stretch. It was cold and cramped, but the payoff was spectacular. This summer, 900 belugas swim right under Doug's nose. There were males and cows with their calves. It was unbelievable. Good fortune reached Prince Leopold, too. For a moment, the Arctic relaxed its grip. The island's precarious ledges were now alive with families of MERS. But filming them required imagination and guts. The height of the cliff was a big problem. Uh, yeah, it's because it was dangerous. And the makeup of the cliff is it's very crumbly. You, you, can't, you can't climb it at all. The wind literally would buffet you and, you know, it, it threatened to actually blow you right off the cliff. And of course, you're not going to survive falling a thousand feet. So we're talking about this 200 pound apparatus that we had to set up right on the edge of the cliff with these rocks that are flaking away. And to get the shot, we, we wanted to actually sweep the camera out with a wide angle lens to sort of give you a, a, a bird's eye view of what it looked like to look straight down. I was completely amazed by the, the, the abundance in, 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 in wildlife up there, not just the bird life, but the, the, the animals in the land, the, 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 the Arctic hare, the foxes. I mean, I just didn't expect that much up there, how animals can survive on, on just snow. 
and the, this long seasons of darkness. of an arctic summer they were rewarded with extraordinary scenes including a lone arctic fox hunting a cliffside meal time the shoot was over, I was ready to go. I was ready to, to go home. Right, but uh, the plane came and we loaded it up and he had to do two trips. And he said, I can only take one person the first flight. And I said, that right. See he, us. He was in that plane <laughs> like a, a weasel into a chicken. Well, I'm... Over two years, Truett and her team captured scenes of the Arctic that had never been filmed before. And they have done it all by living life at the edge. I think you can live up there with half your life and learn something every day. There's nothing can actually compare with, with actually being there at the time. I kind of miss it and I, I, I think I would definitely uh, go back. The Arctic will stick with me forever. It's a place of harshness and power and yet of incredible beauty. It inspires great respect and humility. You just can't help but come back changed. 